Uh, go into screen. Okay, we'll return to screen share and we will kick her off again, I hope. Yay, can everybody see that okay? Yes. Great, okay, onwards and upwards. So, uh, right. These are some of the pressures that animal-based agriculture are applying to our global ecosystem. Rainforest destruction, deforestation, habitat loss, nitrous oxide, climate change, wildlife destruction, etc. I'm sure you're familiar with most of these, if not all of them. So I want to drill into this a little bit for this, for this thing. Now, this is from the Chatham House study from a couple of years back. And they said that without a significant reduction in global meat eating, keeping global warming below two degrees will be nearly impossible. Tackling unsustainable meat consumption is therefore a necessity. Okay, this is just science, nothing to do with how you feel about that consumption. This is the basic numbers on this. We have to, we have no choice. Researchers calculate that reining in meat consumption to the recommended level would cut agricultural emissions of GHGs by 29%. A global shift to a vegetarian diet would slash emissions globally from the system by 63% uh, and ease all kinds of problems from deforestation to desertification, eutrophication, water stress, and free the land available to grow, to grow food directly for humans. And also, by the way, to give land back to nature, to allow rewilding, to allow natural systems to recover. We have hammered nature over the last number of, of decades. We have, to, we have to give nature back space to recover. If we don't, we're goosed. So, and this again is from that same study, they said consumers with a higher level of awareness were more likely to indicate a willingness to reduce their meat and dairy consumption for climate objectives. And what they said is the, there's an awareness gap. There's a striking paucity of efforts to rein in consumption. And they said governments, even environmental groups, have been reluctant to pursue policies to campaigns to shift consumer behavior in relation to moving away from meat-based diets. In fact, uh, the Irish government at the moment uh, we have a trade delegation in the Far East, and we're spending 8 million euros of taxpayers' money via Bordbia in promoting Irish beef, dairy, and lamb products to the wealthy markets of the Far East. This is government policy. We also have a government that declared a climate emergency. So we've got a, a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde going on here uh, between government policy and government action. So again, staying with this report, they said that global meat and dairy consumption by 2050 will have risen by 76% compared to 2015, according to the UNFAO. And that, as I described it, as a lethal double whammy, both for human health and the biosphere. So we just cannot, the planet cannot bear uh, much more uh, animal-based agriculture, irrespective of how you feel about it. It's just a scientific fact. And I think it's important to say, and I do say this to agricultural audiences too, and they don't like me for it much. Um, beef has one of the lowest feed to food conversion efficiencies of most foods. 1% of the primary gross cattle fed energy and 4% of the ingested protein are converted to human edible calories and protein. So basically 99% of the primary energy going involved in, in fattening a beef animal is lost. They're, they're the SUVs of, of agriculture, okay? Incredibly wasteful. So beef uses more land and fresh water and emits more greenhouse gases per unit of protein than any other common food. And I'm sure you'll have seen charts like this, but we'll put it up anyway. We start on the top with diets uh, without meat and dairy products in terms of their greenhouse gas impacts. When you add in meat, uh, without meat, but with dairy products, as you can see, uh, the, the impact increases. And when you add in meat, and dairy products, the um, greenhouse gas impact of that increases dramatically. So the choices that we make in this regard, for whatever our ethical or other uh, reason for making them, the choices that we make carry a great deal of um, importance, let's say. They're very significant. This again is a related study from a few years back where they, they calculated, it, it's probably similar to what I've mentioned already, that a, a move to vegetarianism, veganism, um, could, could cut global food emissions by up to two thirds and save millions of lives into the bargain. So uh, it's not insignificant, uh, although I think particularly in Ireland, uh, huge efforts are made to convince us that um, these livestock, ruminant livestock based food systems are not a problem. They assuredly are a major problem. Now, 
There's other problems too, which you guys will know all about. There's a couple of recent headlines. Um, the one, the, the lower one, I think, is from yesterday or today. Uh, there was a similar case uh, to last year, and these unfortunate calves are a byproduct of an industrialized, intensified system which has no use for these creatures, these sentient creatures. And uh, this situation is really only likely to get worse. These animals, these unfortunate animals, have no commercial value. And as a result of that, um, appalling abuses like described in the lower uh, here are occurring. Um, how rare or common, I'm, I, I can't say for sure, but we do know that the live export of sentient animals um, is, to my mind, and I come from a farming background, I think it's a travesty. I think it's appalling. Um, uh, but, and now, of course, they're not just going, once upon a time, live animals went to the UK. Now we've got live animals on ships going to um, Libya. They could be on the ship for days, even weeks. And you may remember um, the Suez Canal was blocked for a period uh, last year. Tens of thousands of animals starved to death and died of, of, of malnutrition and, and, and thirst on ships that were backed up in the, um, in the Suez Canal. So I think it's a, you know, it's a vile trade. And really, a modern country should have nothing to do with live animal exports. But that's just my view. Others will disagree. In terms of what we call the process of processing animals, right? So let's say raising food for animals uses about 45% of the Earth's uh, total land, right? We're clearing about one to two acres of rainforest a second. 55% of the water, say, in the US is uh, used for animal agriculture. This, again, we're, we're, we're triggering habitat and loss and species extinction. Uh, factory farms, again, this particular slide is germane to the US. Uh, now, about 150 billion animals are slaughtered every year for food, right? Um, livestock produces 116,000 pounds per, of waste per second. And again, the antibiotic slide is, is more relevant to the US than it's not permitted here. Animal agriculture um, by some estimates can, can account for up to half of greenhouse gas emissions. Other estimates put it lower at maybe 15 to 20%, but either way, uh, on a global scale, it's extremely significant. And um, that's just some basic, fact. some of these stats are very specific to the US, and uh, but I'm putting them up there, I suppose, more for discussion, let's just say. Not suggesting everything you see on screen has to be taken to be uh, to be gospel on this particular slide. Now, you know, I guess so far I've been giving you all, all the bad news, all the scary slides. You know, there are some not so scary slides. And one of my favorite ones is called the Swanson effect. If you haven't seen it, it's a wonderful slide. Here it is. OK, this shows you what um, a watt of solar energy cost in 1977. A single watt in 1977 cost $76 per single watt of solar power. And in 2013, it's 74 cents, okay? So it has fallen a hundred fold. Now, this is a little out of date, but it's probably fallen by another 20, 25 cents, even in that intervening period. So the point I guess I'm making, in, including a little bit of good news here, just to break up the bad news, is that <coughs> we can make good choices as well as bad choices. And here's a headline from a couple of years ago, making the point. And I think in the midst of an energy crisis that we're now dealing with, I think it's important to say that renewables uh, are getting a lot of stick. But in fact, they are keeping the price. For example, right now, the price of electricity on the Irish grid is being kept down by wind. Not so much solar. We don't have much of the grid yet, but it's been kept down by our renewables. So we shouldn't allow ourselves to be bullied into giving up on them because that would be a huge mistake. Anyway, let's get, let's get the good news out of the way. We, let's get back to the good stuff. So I suppose this is a way of thinking about it. Nature shrinks as capital grows and the growth of the market, and this applies to anything, whether it's solar panels or uh, fossil fuels, the growth of the market cannot solve the very crisis that it creates. And the little egg timer here is basically the, the conversion of the natural world into what we call human civilization, okay? So I think that's worth just putting up there, let's say. Now, um, I have a short video here, uh, which I'm actually going to skip, all right? I'm going to... What happens? Yeah, it's <laughs> too too dystopian for this hour of the evening. Anyway, so, so I suppose um, 
this is the, the book that got me uh, started on this particular topic nearly 20 years ago. It was an environmental history of the 20, 20th century by a, a Georgetown professor called J.R. McNeil. And he put it very simply, he said, the human race without intending it has undertaken a gigantic uncontrolled experiment on the earth, which I think is a great way of thinking about this. We didn't set out to <laughs> you know, see what would happen, but I'm afraid we have, uh, well, We've, we've changed things in very profound ways. And all kinds of, in my world, let's say, it may not be your world, but in my world, the kind of headlines you're seeing on, on screen here now are quite typical, right? Um, there's, you know, we're, we're in an era of bad news and worse news ecologically. Climate is sort of the tip of the spear, but the collapsing ecosystems are the real bad news here. And this is sweeping away the natural world with it, unfortunately. And um, I think it's important as well to say, uh, at least for me anyway, personally, that how I get through this stuff is um, to, to process it communally um, because it's too difficult to deal with by yourself. And maybe that's why I do things like I'm doing tonight. Uh, I do like to talk about it, strangely enough, but it's oddly comforting. Maybe it's my giving, giving my pain to you guys. It's like uh, giving it away, right? So... Um, and again, the same speaker, Dr. Christ Christina Nichols, she put it very well, and I like this. She said, the only thing that may save us may be our own broken hearts, for true action can only come through these deeper feelings. And I think there's truth in that. As long as we continue to treat this as a trifle, we won't act. And as long as we don't act, we're doomed, right? So until our hearts are broken, then we have no chance. And the problem is people don't like having their hearts broken. So... It's difficult. And another scientist called, well, the wonderfully named Dr. Kate Marble, uh, she put it like this. I'll, I'll get her for you now. If I, well, I hope I will. Yeah, here she said, she said, we need courage, not hope, to face climate change. We have hope is a, a form, there's a drug called hopium that people inject into them, into their veins, uh, which is basically false hope. Uh, and hopium delays action by telling us that something is going to turn up and someone's going to invent something. No, no, it isn't. No, they're not. Either we come together to fix this or we don't. So, so hope, beware of people selling you hope uh, unless they've got something to back it up. So this is another environmental scientist who I'm a big fan of. He put it very well. He said, he's been working on this for years. He said that I used to think the big problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, climate change. And I thought with 30 years of good science, we could address the problems. But as he said, I was wrong. And he said, the real problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need this spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. I think it's wonderful because, you know, the, this has been, a lot of this pain has been dumped on the scientific community. It's up to scientists, not just to do the science, but also to explain to society what it means and how we've got to change and how we've got to react to it. I think it's asking too much. The rest of civil society has got to help science to take these difficult messages into the public domain. And um, I guess I'm coming towards the end. So I'm going to wrap it up with a couple of slides. This is a favorite uh, writer of mine, a guy called Clive Hamilton. He's an, an Australian ethicist, and that's his book, Requiem for Species. And uh, he puts it this way. He said, awakening to the prospect of climate disruption compels us to abandon most of the comfortable beliefs that have sustained our sense of the world as a stable place. And when we recognize that our dreams of the future are built on sand, the human the natural human response is to despair, but we can't give in. And he said, in the current circumstances, clinging to hopefulness is just another form of denial. We have to allow ourselves to enter a phase of desolation and hopelessness. In short, we have to grieve. And what are we grieving for? We're grieving for the loss of the future that we thought was ours. It's gone. Now, this is a little clip from a, a movie from 2008, which I will share with you because it always makes me smile. So buckle up. I need to know what's happening. This planet is dying. The human race is killing it. So you've come here to help us? No, I didn't. You said you came to save us. I said I came to save the Earth. You came to save the Earth. From us. You came to save the Earth. You can't risk the survival of this planet for the sake of one species. What are you saying? If the Earth dies, you die. If you die, the Earth survives. There are only a handful of planets in the cosmos that are capable of supporting complex life. You can't do this. this one, 
and be allowed to perish. We can change. We could still turn things around. Watched, we waited and hoped that you would change. Please. It's reached the tipping point. We have to act. Please. We'll undo the damage you've done and give the earth a chance to begin again. Don't do that. Please. We could change. We could change. The decision is made. The process has begun. Oh. There you go. Uh, that's the movie, by the way, is called uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still. It's a remake of a 1950s, uh, one of those um, B-movies. But actually, I kind of like that one. And uh, Keanu Reeves is always out of this world as an alien. So um, I'm just about done. I'm going to close up with one of my favorite slides. It's called The Three Stages of Grief. Um, we got despair, act, sorry, despair, accept, and finally act. And we'll put this in the words of our friendly local doctor. We have had your test results. May I be blown with you? Yeah. Right. Well, everything is fine. You're not gonna die. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Right. Bye. <laughs> now that's it thank you all <laughs> so um the, the the ryan line is open for questions and for complaints uh well i have a couple of questions if i may please do yeah so uh thank you john for your presentation if that's the right word uh please excuse my dressing gown uh global warming soaked me on the way back from the supermarket earlier on Mm -hmm. um yeah i want to ask you a kind of sociological question which you might be able, not be able to answer but and also another one in the sense that um when i was lecturing at ucd i used to ask the students whether those people currently having babies had rejected the climate th um, thesis or whether they weren't even thinking about it and i wonder what your kind of thoughts are about that and secondly i wonder whether you've looked at the prospect of vertical farming in terms of your presentation and you know the future etc sure okay maybe if i can start with the um the babies i know people in my social circle obviously younger than i am uh, who have chosen not to have children plain and simple young couples who've just said not doing it. um i think the risk and the fear uh, and the, the, the sense of just lacking, lacking the ability to uh, the feeling that they would be unable to, to, to guarantee anything remotely approaching a secure future for their for their kids. So some people have made that decision, quite frankly. Uh, I would never, ever uh, counsel somebody on that. I think it's a personal decision. For example, you know, in the height of the Second World War, when millions of people were dying, people were making babies. Right. People were against all the odds when 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 the world was on fire 70, 80 years ago, people were still doing what people do. Right. And some people, maybe for them, that's a way through it. Uh, in my case, it's a little bit too late because uh, I have a couple of teenagers. So therefore, the die is cast. And I suppose that gives me, you know, I guess uh, a very much a connection to the middle of the century. I won't be around for it, but others will. So that's the, the baby thing. Uh, I think it's an intensely personal decision. Um, some people, and people break in different ways on it. Some people see having babies as a kind of a, if you like, a call to arms, right? And if that's good, you know, if that helps them to be more motivated, great. Uh, your second question was about vertical farming. Yeah, I suppose um, I'm aware of it, obviously. Uh, if you look in countries like um, Holland, they've got, you know, hydroponic agriculture systems there, world's second largest food exporter, um, remarkably efficient at producing food. Um, our system is, is uh, a good deal less so. Uh, we're, we're very resource intensive. Uh, just a second, excuse me. It's a very noisy pug. I can't hear a thing. Anyway, so yeah, so um, so yeah, I mean, like we need to find a way. And has, if anyone on the call has read Regenesis, the new book by George Mambio, I'd recommend it. Uh, he looks at his view. First of all, is that animal agriculture is you know a clear and present threat to life on Earth for all kinds of reasons, and I can't disagree with him. 
Uh, but secondly, he said we possibly probably even need to go beyond uh, at this stage, he said we may even need to go beyond just plant based agriculture and to move towards um, food production, synthetic food production using, um, I suppose, biotechnology, right? And to produce the kind of food levels that we need uh, and also to take the strain off the earth. But anyway, you can, you can explore those ideas uh, if you choose to read the book Regenesis by George Monbiot. Um, yeah, different people have looked at different systems, different options and have different ways of thinking about it. What we know for sure is that, you know, 8 billion humans have put a, a huge strain on Earth's resources, especially the wealthiest, the, the, the high consumers, which includes 80 uh, percent, at least 80 percent of the population of Ireland are among that global elite, whether we believe it or not. We spend a lot of time whining about how, how bad things are here, but we're among the richest people in the world at the richest time in the history of the world. So by and large, uh, in fact, I was watching a, that documentary last night on RT called The Way We Were, uh, which if you if anyone's seen it, uh, it goes back six or seven decades or even five or six decades to rural electrification in Ireland when people, you know, literally were pissing in pots outside their houses. And this is such a short time from which we've gone from having very little to having apparently everything. And uh, and many of these changes have been changes for the good, but unfortunately, the ecological toll along the way has been has uh, piled up, as some of my um, presentation would 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 indicate. Yes, thanks very much for that. No problems. So, any other takers? Um, yeah. I, 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 does anyone else go first? I'll talk later. Thanks. Um, yeah. Could I could I come in? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, Hi, I can hear you. Um, I think I met you in uh, Clears many years ago in Kilkenny. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> was, was, I, was I debating with the, the chap, the, the Glanbia fella? Yeah, I think you probably were. <laughs> <laughs> I remember as well, yes. Um, okay. Thank you very much for your um, presentation. Um, there is, I mean, I, I would love to sit down and talk to you about so many different things within it. Sure. Um, and outside it. Um, I mean, it's tricky, isn't it? Like the climate anxiety thing, I've actually moved past it. Hmm. And I think it's actually, that may be a problem in itself in that so many people are because we're actually sick of hearing the term climate change. And, I, and I, I, I'm not a denier, okay? Hmm. Um, but the climate change, when you are, when you have done your absolute utmost, um, I was, my father was an environmentalist. I grew up, the first project I ever did was on, was on rivers in Ireland, and that was in the 1970s as well, um, mm. and the pollution. And so, and I'm a vegan, I've been a vegan for, for a number of years, not, uh, not enough years, because I didn't wake up um, early enough to the cruelty, actually, aspect of it, even more so than the damage. Sure. And NGOs are not talking about the cruelty. We are still not um, showing people what is actually happening behind closed doors. There is a very good um, website called Animals Behind Closed, closed Doors, which you may know, John, created by Jerry Boland. And the, the, the dishonesty, um, I think, is absolutely shocking um, to, 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 to the population. And I think NGOs have got a huge um, responsibility there. They won't talk about it. None of our politicians will talk about it. As you say, like even today on the news, that story about the 400 calves, um, they did all the sports first. And then they went, oops, sorry, we haven't got time for that, that story. That story was a story about neglect, um, horrendous cruelty, um, where they found where people, you know, had to complain about the smells. Um, I think that the problem with, uh, you know, things like the wild animals being extinct is that the people now who live, like I have three children, and they're all grown up. My, my youngest is 18. Um, he doesn't know about the animals that are extinct now because when I was growing up, I didn't know about the animals that are extinct when I was growing up. So you, we don't, they don't really care that much because it's, it's, it doesn't actually mean anything. Um, it's, it's very hard to, you know, it's, it's this constant kind of trying to make people feel guilty, but actually until governments really decide to do things, we can, we can actually only do so much, you know, the, the whole, the push is at the moment is animal agriculture, animal agriculture, animal agriculture. And I have, I have, believe it or not, friends who are farmers. One in particular, I was out on his farm recently. 
he's a suckler farmer, another one is a dairy farmer. They are still being paid to to do to keep doing what they're doing. And as you say, we are sending you know ambassadors out to um, Egypt, where we're about to start sending beef you know beef um, animals to Egypt. We have Catherine Thomas as the ambassador to the NDC. We're still lying to school children and telling them they need milk. So we have these bubbles here where we chat and we talk, but uh, you know, and you can feel it feels very frustrating. I, I really take object, objection to people being told that I, I'm glad you said, John, that it's a personal choice regarding children, because that is people having children is actually not a problem. I don't think. Yes, there are too many of us, but 80 billion domesticated animals, livestock animals and 8 billion people just like there is no, you know. Um, yeah, there's I, I mean, there's just masses of things I could say, but I better give other people a chance. So, um, oh, and oh, sorry, my last one food growing vertically i believe in good food real food i think people need to be on the land need to be growing food need to be tending to the land shoving them into cities and growing our food vertically um is not going to be good for our health either mentally or physically it's not going to be good for the for the land either yes we need to do things in a completely different way um but i do not think that is the answer and i think george monbiot as much as i admire him is getting a lot of things wrong and he's getting the backs of people who actually Many of them want to change, but they can't change yet because they're being they're still being encouraged to do the wrong thing. Sure. Yeah. No. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure if if you if you want me to comment or or just you were just making some general observations, but um, you know I I think there's there's a lot there's plenty in what you say and and uh, yeah I mean what can we do? Um, yeah. Is there anything in particular you'd like me to comment on or just anything, John? <laughs> Any yeah. of them that you think was... I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know where to start. I mean, the say, in relation to the food thing, you know, I do think, um, you know, I do think we need to to back off. I think our, our agricultural systems are broken, largely, unfortunately. And I think we're, we're going to need to back away from nature and we're going to have to, to rewild large chunks of, of the world. And that requires a completely different relationship with food uh, and and... A lightening of our of our footstep now that of course assumes by the way that we're operating in a stable climatic environment the problem as i've outlined in my slides earlier is we're not in a stable climatic environment we're in a rapidly destabilizing climatic environment i think we're going to struggle to grow food outdoors soon um uh, for example the bbc reported the other day that 80 percent of the livestock in pakistan have been drowned in the last um couple of weeks now the figure sounds extraordinarily high I can't verify it. I didn't include a slide about it for that reason. Um, but, you know, I think food production, just on that, uh, I think we probably need to go, go on to need to go under glass uh, or under into polytunnels and so on, where we can produce, where we can basically limit the, the capricious effect of extreme weather by kind of sealing ourselves off from it and using artificial irrigation and so on. I think... You do that because that's that's going to work. And also, like the Dutch have shown, you can produce unbelievably. Like, for example, in the in the Dutch uh, greenhouse systems, they've more or less eliminated pesticide use because they don't have pests inside the greenhouses, so they don't need to use pesticides. They also recycle their water inside the greenhouses, and they their 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 water footprint is a fraction of what it would be outdoors, and their pesticides are more or less not used at all. So I think. High technology, we you know we've high technology in computers and in all kinds of things. I think we can, I think we can deal with a little bit of high technology in food production as well. I don't think it's, you know, a bad thing. You know, I think you know if you were going into hospital and you needed a stent, I don't think high technology is always our enemy, right? You know, there's lots of times that it's our friend. And I think in in food production, I think we do need to use our brains uh, and give them. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just, sorry, I'm going to come sure. in again, John. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think it's very, it was, it's interesting. But first of all, we already have too much food. I don't believe we are anywhere near enough. First of all, if you go into a supermarket, I would say you could cut out maybe two thirds of what is in a supermarket. Sure. The amount of weight, first of all, I mean, we all know 40% of food is thrown away in people's homes. Now, I don't throw away anything, but that's because of the way I am and the way I was brought up. Sure. Um, it's because of the way it's sold to them through the supermarket system. Um, it's it's done because of the way um, uh, supermarkets force farmers to, to grow food and to throw away food that is the wrong size. 
we don't have, I don't think there is a problem with the, the, the amount of food we have. We also eat far too much, far too much food. Our plates yeah. are too big. We have too many restaurants, too many cafes. We are, we are, and they throw out so much. I mean, there needs to be a whole massive shift in this talk. Like Ireland's big thing is we need to feed 45 million people or something. I can't remember what the figure is. It's absolute nonsense. We export 90% of the beef we produce, as you know. One of the really big ones that no one also will talk about is baby formula. I mean, we, we won't even go there with, with health of a child, a baby from day one, which we are shoving, pushing at that, um, a product that is that is made by a cow and modified in a factory and then sent in a in a tin and made and, and made huge. I mean, the, the waste of of resources to go into industries that are producing food we don't even need. That's that that's the problem. So, like, I mean, this we have a small farm that there's a, a a fantastic farm here in Kilkenny. We have we're very lucky. We have a number of um of organic farms. And there's a guy called Shane Hatton. He's he's got a farm called Bosco's Farm. And this year is his third or fourth year, I think. And he's expanding, expanding, expanding. He's, he's, he's absolutely amazing. He's growing all kinds of stuff. He's got polytunnels, he's got stuff outside. He's, he's doing no dig, he, dig he, he drills into the ground. I mean, he really is extraordinary. He has, he's had aphids, but he has ladybirds. He has bees, but he, he's ne he has used no pesticides whatsoever. He's not using high technology. He's doing a really good job. You know, I don't think we, I think we need to rethink um, what we need in terms of food, how much we need in terms of food, what's real. We need to, there needs to be huge um, uh, control taken of supermarkets and of way food is. I, I don't know if you remember during the pandemic. I remember there were acres and acres and acres of onion farms in America dug up and dug back into the soil because nobody makes onion rings at home. You know, sure, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. It was just such an example of what a shit system it is yeah you know and, supermarkets and, can tell an entire country we want you just to grow onions nothing else and we'll take them all yeah i think you're, you're describing to charge 10 cents for a bag of onions no one can grow onions yeah, for 10 i think you're describing capitalism there and and you know uh like <laughs> yeah. capitalism runs the food system and it's a it's a system that operates to the benefit of a tiny minority uh, and i think to the detriment particularly of primary producers and I think, yeah, I think our supermarkets, our food uh, production system has has forced primary producers into some very bad decisions, I think, in, in a lot of cases. And I think also those large players have a disproportionate say in policy. They tend to drive policy. And uh, that's, I think, part of the problem as well, that they're very much pushing policy. Yeah. There was another hand up, by the way, under you. There's a gentleman on a bicycle. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, yeah. Maybe not. Uh, I'll just get him out. Stephen? Yeah, hi. Sorry, I didn't ah. know I had the bicycle picture on there. <laughs> <laughs> there yeah, go. but Let's kind see. of Lucy is echoing what I think a lot of us feel and have experienced that, you know, people have been pushing back against the system since Silent Spring in 1960, flipping two. Yeah. And where are we? We're still running down that hill with no problems. And uh, basically, what can we do? Can, is there anything new that we can do? Is there a lever we can pull? Is there something that is working? You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, civil yeah. disobedience is not new. You know, no. it might have looked like it when XR appeared on the scene. Um, what what is likely the most useful thing that we can do? Yeah, it, it's a pretty good question. I think um, most people who've looked at this in depth recognize that the the system, the consumption and growth based system that we have built up around ourselves, is um, is killing us, and it's it's killing our life support systems. And it's going to run the climate system into the red. Well, it's already running into the red, but it's going to run it off cliff. So we're basically going to have to figure out, I think I put it recently in an article that I wrote about it. I said, it's, we face a choice between permanent austerity and catastrophe, right? The problem is nobody believes me, right? 
Uh, mm -hmm. That's the choice. That's what's on the table, right? You know, the, the good days, the so-called good old days are over, right? The, the flying, the, the driving, the, the high living, that's all, that's all behind us, right? And we're going to have to, to knuckle down and, and hunker down for much tougher times ahead. Um, and they have been forced on us anyway by, by the unraveling, as I said, of, of ecosystems that we've basically broken, right? And they're, it's taken them a time to collapse, and they're collapsing kind of slowly but surely. Uh, marine ecosystems are in free fall as well. And they're going to pull pull the rest of us down with them. Of course, they are. It's it's completely obvious. In fact, it's it's miraculous that that so many of them are still tottering, as opposed to you know even at this point. And yeah, I don't know. I you know I this is something I've grappled with for nearly twenty years. What do you do? Um, I don't know. I guess everybody has their own way. For me, it's writing about it, talking about it, uh, talking with people about it. You know, um, and. But in terms of solutions, I'm very wary of solutionism. Uh, I think the way somebody put it, they said that, you know, problems have solutions and predicaments have outcomes. I think we're in a predicament rather than facing a problem here. And I think, you know, the, the range of outcomes with this predicament go from, as I say, from bad to unthinkable. And I think we're going to have to choose to... We're going to have to voluntarily, somehow, collectively choose to give up a whole bunch of stuff uh, or, have, or have everything taken away from us. And until we come to that recognition, then we're just going to pretend that everything's fine. And I, again, I sometimes use the analogy of the oncology ward here, and apologies if it's uncomfortable to anybody on the call, but the notion that, you know, uh, you're given a difficult diagnosis and you've got tough choices. And the question is, do you, you know, submit to the harsh regime with no certainty of success or do you whistle Dixie and, and head out of the of the consulting room get back into your car go home and continue your life like it never happened and at the moment we are in the cosmic waiting room right we've been given the diagnosis we know that all the choices ahead are bad and tough but some of them at least have some some hope in them but at the moment we're still whistling Dixie and getting back in the car. We're not facing the fact that we've been given basically a, a life-limiting diagnosis, all of us. And until we accept that, then we will continue to continue. Um, can I come um, in again? Um, oh, could, could, I, could I actually, mm -hmm. um, I think, I mean, like there are kind of two pillars that need to be pushed down, uh, I suppose. Um, um, you know, well, really, it's it's one one interconnected part of the system, as in um, people buy power, and most of the governments of the world are they've been bought up, haven't they? I mean, do do you think that's a fair assessment? <laughs> I think and, it's a totally fair uh, assessment. Yeah. Well, as I think we need person, to but... protest for transparency and a change to the constitution that decouples. Um, financial support um, from the power that a party has. It should level the playing field. Yeah, that's certainly one thing you can do uh, for sure. The problem is, though, that the, the, the power structures are very deeply uh, embedded. You know, take media, you know, um, the control of so many media organisations, not so much in Ireland, but particularly in the UK, by effectively malign billionaires who mm -hmm. are intent on burning the world down for profit. And how are you going to stop them? How are you going to negotiate with them? I don't know. Uh, mm. they, they're not amenable to reason. And I think it's important to stress here that there are many of the people who are driving this crisis are not amenable to reason. I think many of them are well aware of what they're doing. They don't care. Yeah. It's, they're making yeah. too much money. And I think uh, I was asked this in the podcast earlier today, you know, but what about the billionaires? Surely they've got kids too. Honestly, they're planning to, to escape to their bunkers in New Zealand. They know what's coming, but they believe their money. Of course, there's a ship, yeah. <laughs> as yeah. the film goes. Yeah, no, honestly, these, these, the folks who are, who are driving this particular you know, ship over the cliff, they know what's coming, uh, but they honestly believe that they can survive it and that they can do okay, and the rest of us can die screaming. And that's quite honestly the case. 
what we do about this as people, whether we meekly go to our fate or whether we, you know, try to resist. I don't know. I'm, you know, all for things like XR and so on. I think we need to we need to uh, push back as civilians, as citizens, uh, and say this is not good enough. Uh, but at the moment, I think we're very fragmented. You know, we have NGOs, you know, on mm. this, that, and the other. Whether it's, you know, as like we're talking saving animal welfare. My argument is this: if if we lose the climate and ecological battle, right? It doesn't matter what your battle is because the ship goes to the bottom of the sea and all is lost, okay? So maybe that makes me selfish and maybe that makes me, me kind of narrow-minded and people will say, well, you know, you're just hung up on one thing. But my one thing I'm hung up on is keeping our some version of a habitable world for ourselves and our kids and, and the rest of nature, by the way, or at least some of the rest of nature. And at the moment, we're losing all of that. And I don't, I really, truly don't have the answers. I wish I did. Um, Thank you. Yeah, just another one there. Um, I, I totally disagree with your analogy of the doctor and the patient. I, I, I really, it really actually bugs me because um, it's I did, sort of, I did apologize in advance for that. Yes, that I know, I know. It's sort of, and, and you see, I think it doesn't, I think what, what does actually happen, and it's no, and we know it happens. There's the placebo and there's the nocebo. And you have the, the God who tells you that you're going to die. Um, and there's a, you know, will I tell you the bad news? And, and you say yes. And then this God says, you know, you're going to die in six months time. So you do. And I think this is where we are with, with this at the moment. I think it's, it's so big. It's so enormous because it's climate crisis. OK, it's not Irish ecosystems in trouble. It's not let's, you know. This is why I think that so many people are switching off. I mean, I actually, I actually believe it. Do not listen to the news anymore. I read the Irish Times on a Saturday. That's it. And then I see stuff from Sentient Ireland. I work with an animal rights group. I'm, you know, I'm working with a vegan group. I'm also studying me medical herbalism, which is, I think, the way we need to go with our medicine because I'm so sick of pharmaceutical industries, also with their hold on governments, um, particularly around the world. Um, and I think we need to go. We need to. We need to shrink right back down and we need to actually because we can't do everything about um this and i really think i really need, think we need to shift um i mean what do we got like when the next elections come up in this country i walked with green party members and i joined the green party i walked with them i tried to get them elected i am sick of them every single one of them i wouldn't vote for one of them i will probably spoil my vote in the next election because i don't believe any of them um so I think we need to go back to, to, to communities. We need to, we definitely need to start growing. And, and we are, I'm in the permaculture group um, in my own town. And I, I know that sounds tiny and ridiculous, particularly John, when you're looking at the bigger picture and you're seeing huge stuff, but there is, we cannot solve those problems. We just can't do it. And when you have fracking going on and when you have Davos going on and when you have private planes going, you know, people just going like, what the hell is that about like here we are being made to feel like it's our fault which yes we all we all are a part of it but when you see this going on it's it's it, it, it's like you know i think we have to stop saying feel guilty feel bad you're going to die you're going to die you're going to die because actually we are anyway um and we know that the planet as vandana shiva says mother earth will continue without us very I just uh, just as a point of information, I never asked anyone to feel guilty about anything on my call tonight. No, I, I, if people want to feel bad, that's their own business. But I never laid a guilt trip on anybody on this call. OK, not guilty, but no, uh, not guilty. Uh, OK, not guilty, John, but mm -hmm. um, very, 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 very pessimistic. Sure. Well, that, that, that's I guess, you know what? That's my diagnosis based on. 20 years of study in this space right yeah if, you, if you've come to a different conclusion i respect that no no I haven't. I, i'm not saying for a second that um my conclusion is correct or infallible you know i guess i was asked here to to give my observations for what they're worth um, but but i'm not telling you what to think how to think or i'm not telling you how to feel because i you know i have enough trouble deciding how to feel about this stuff myself oh do you want to put them on Yes. You no. Know? Yeah. So I'm not telling anyone to feel anything. Uh, what people feel is their own business. I'm not yeah. telling anybody 
to have children or not have children. I'm not telling them what to eat. I'm not here. I'm not, you know, I'm not the hall monitor, right? I'm offering for what it's worth my, my. Yeah. Yeah. I'm only being, I'm, I'm, I'm only else. arguing the other side, John. I'm only, I'm only trying to get, I'm trying to see, I, you know, I'm no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just thinking that I'm, it's not, it's not just, it's not you. It's, 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 it's every single day, which is why I probably don't look at it. I mean, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's constant. Like every time you turn on the radio, it's, it's, mm -hmm. It's either climate change or another vaccine. Like it's, it's you know, it's one or the other. <laughs> yeah, well, to be honest with you, if, and I will say this uh, fairly clearly, um, the biggest problem I've experienced in the last 20 years in the climate space is that it doesn't get enough attention and it's not taken seriously enough. Right? Well, we've certainly um, done the opposite now, haven't we? I, I completely disagree, profoundly yeah. disagree. This is the greatest existential emergency in the history of our species. And if it slightly annoys people that we're talking about this, well, I'm not sure what to say about that. If, if people are, feel bored and disengaged by the death of life on Earth, well, I'm not quite sure what we should feel. Yeah, I, I'm not really I'm not really saying that, John. I'm not really saying I'm bored. You're saying, you're saying kind of like I'm sick and tired of hearing about climate change on the news. And I'm saying that I, I want to hear I want to hear what we are going to do. Sure. That's what I want to hear, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and we have all been, I mean, as I said, I, yeah. I, I, you know, and there's an awful lot of us who really do absolute, I mean, I avoid plastics, I don't eat meat, I don't eat dairy, I don't, I have one car, which I use as little as possible, I cycle everywhere, I go to the farmer's market, I, you know, and there's masses and masses of people like me. And, and it's kind of like, what more can we do? Buy an electric car? Really? Is that going to make any difference? Then you're told about the lithium that's being dug up and the children that are used in the mines. And then you, and you think, OK, well, then maybe I shouldn't do that. And then, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's really to hard to know what to do. Yeah. Uh, actually really, make any difference at all. Yeah, you got me. Uh, Dennis wanted to come in there, I think. Yeah. Uh, what I wanted to say, and some of it you answered, uh, but I'm kind of more specific while I'm looking for John. And thank you for this evening, by the way. And it's great to see everybody here, all the familiar faces and the not so familiar faces. And some people I know from other uh, platforms as well, uh, one future in particular. So, John, the question I have for you is this. Um, in terms of going forward and thinking of us as activists, and what I want to know is what would be our best method for getting the word out? This is to... Um, go through the apathy, go through everything uh, that's negative. This is for us, Sentient Rights Ireland. What would be our best way? I'm thinking about you as a media person, you know about broadcasting. I also want to, the second strand of the question is, should we get more science up? I think we should. Should we get more government action and media? So would you address that in a kind of a twofold way in, in terms of what Sentient Rights Ireland could or should be doing to get the word out and what the scientists, governments and media should and could be doing. That's the question. Okay, I'm, like when you say that, just so I understand the question, Dennis, you're saying basically like in terms of, of making increasing awareness of animal sentience and so on. I mean, it's something I've touched on, I know, in, in, in my weekly column with, with uh, yes. Mark Cooper a couple of times. I think it's, you know, I was listening well, to Sean, Sean Moncrief did a piece about it recently. Uh, you know, I think I think it's an incredibly interesting subject, but it's often framed as being anti-farmer, right? If yeah, you're well, if you're pro-sentient, yeah. you're anti-farmer, right? I remember I was in this debate, so-called debate with a farming group one time, and I was accused of being an animal rights advocate, as if that was a dirty word. And I had to respond to say that I'm an animal welfare advocate, right? So first of all, I'd say you have to pick your language very carefully because the folks on the other side will try to marginalize you and paint you as an extremist and as an unreasonable party at every chance. Well, John, 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 that's not the question I want. I want to know about in the topic that we're on about tonight, which is the climate. All we right. We kind of understand what we have to do about sentience. We're oh, sorry, I that. didn't. I misunderstood your question. Yeah, I didn't explain myself very well either. I'm not okay. having a great evening. Anyway, so the in terms of activism, how should we go about getting the word out in terms of what would be the best way to broadcast it all, and then how could we get scientists more involved and get you know have programs on RTE more, get more information from government offices and. The media how should how should all those four 
different sections of society move forward to get the word into people's heads. You really need to do something here, act, and what are the best actions to do? Yeah, um, it's kind of, I don't think I have a single answer to that, Dennis. I think um, having more, more media, sorry, having more science literate people in the media who understand climate science. And what I found is that over the years, I found very few people in the media kind of grasp climate science. They, yeah. they, they, they sort of the think one, they do. Hmm? The one thing that I have found talking to a lot of people, this is my own circle, they don't understand the term global warming. And you touched on that, you were saying 4% doesn't sound much, you know, 20 degrees to 24 degrees. That's not what we're actually talking about in terms of global warming. So I, I think there's a problem getting people to understand the basics is, is what I feel. And what yeah. would be the best way, best way to go about getting that word out? Yeah, I think uh, like, you know, sessions like this evening, which was designed you know, I wasn't exactly sure where to pitch it, but I yeah. designed it to try to kind of talk about the, the science, not too much, but enough to, to have a solid basis of understanding about the science. And then yeah. to go on from there to say, OK, um, armed with this science, what do we do and where do we go? Um, you know, I think my argument is that this is the overarching emergency of the 21st century. And therefore, it deserves, in my opinion, um, to be you know, front, front and central. For example, I've lobbied with RTE for, for them to, to appoint uh, specialist writers, specialist journalists, specialist broadcasters with specific information. And I'll give you an example, Dennis, right? Philip Alger Hayes, uh, as a, an RTE journalist, has produced a series called Hot Mess, which looks into all different aspects of climate change and climate policy. And it's superb, right? It's a great example of public service broadcasting. And I think that's the kind of thing we need, in-depth investigative work that it helps to explain complex issues to people, breaks them down uh, and challenges assumptions and, and a lot of preconceptions about, about, about things. Like, for example, one of his episodes looked at opposition, say, to solar farms, for example, and why people object to things and so on and so forth. So, so better, better journalism, more journalism. Uh, much more engagement on the media part, but also I think to understand that this is not a, a kind of a, a niche subject. The climate environment ecology is an everything subject. And I would argue that people like finance writers and broadcasters and current affairs specialists, they need to understand that they're operating, that, that the climate environment is part of their brief too. At the moment, the attitude is, uh, they don't feel they need to be expert on it. So, you know, for example, you know, you take a frontline RT broadcaster, say Claire Byrne, you know, they're experts, say, in politics, but they wouldn't have that level of expertise in climate, ecology, environment. And their feeling is they don't need to have it. My argument is everybody in public life, media, politics, needs to understand this like their life depended on it, because essentially it does. We get this wrong, as we're doing now, we continue to get this wrong, you know, millions, then billions die horribly. And I know you can say we're all going to die, but that's a totally different question, right? We would hope to die a natural death in our own time. But what we're looking at, as I outlined in my, in my presentation, we're looking at the rapid unraveling of everything. Now, I think that's worth uh, fighting to prevent fighting to forestall and fighting for our kids, our grandchildren and the natural world, fighting to save everything we can and fighting to give the future some space to survive in. That, that, that's what I want to see from our media. That's what I want to see in the public space. And if that rubs people up the wrong way, well, guilty as charged, right? Because yeah. I cannot think of a more important task. And the reason I'm here at half eight on a Tuesday night <laughs> is precisely this, because even if it's just a handful of people, we need to have these conversations. Some people want to hear them. Other people don't want to hear them. That's fine. I've been in many rooms on many occasions with many groups of people, and I'll just keep talking until you tell me to stop. Okay, just, just to finish up, I think we should call a wrap soon, but I'd just yeah. like to finish up on this note. Uh, first of all, thank everybody for being here tonight. And thank you, John, for a wonderful uh, 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 presentation really enjoyed it and i really didn't enjoy it but 
animal rights as a concept is not an extreme concept. Animal rights violations are an extreme happening. And the lack of animal rights in Ireland and the world is what underpins all animal abuse. So that's our position. I Thank completely concur with that position, Dennis, completely. Thank you. Yeah, OK. OK, thank you all. Good night. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank you. All Bye -bye. the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.